Did I step on something? Thank you, Brenda. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. You know, we spent most of the summer uh, going through First Peter, and I mentioned that we were going to spend the summer going through the epistles of Peter. Last week, we wrapped up uh, First Peter. And so this week, we're going to jump in uh, to Second Peter. And this is a significantly shorter epistle. Uh, it should take us just about a month. We should be done by the end of August. Um, if we have a moment, we may do Jude before we get into the fall, if we get through it. Uh, Jude and Second Peter run parallel in some ways. Um, but we'll see how that goes. So if you have a Bible, open it up to Second Peter chapter 1. We're going to be starting in verse 1. Peter writes this, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just invite your presence here this morning with us as we dig through the word. Lord Jesus, we just ask, let your word become alive to us. Let it saturate our lives. Let it transform our lives. Let it become real. Lord, quiet off any distractions that, that we may have brought here and just allow us to hear clearly from you this morning. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Come and have your way in this place. We just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Throughout uh, Scripture, there are a handful of books that I will call challenging books, books that scholars and historians and, uh, have, have just wrestled with. They're not sure what to do with these books. In the Old Testament, we know some of these books, books like Job or Ecclesiastes. If you've ever read Ecclesiastes, it's a depressing book. Uh, Solomon basically comes to the end of it saying, it's all worthless. There's nothing that's worthwhile, so just worship God and die and enjoy yourself. And it, it's this incredibly depressing book in the end. Uh, Job, if you read Job, is, is a book that, we, that people struggle with because uh, Job is going through all of these difficulties and hardships and, and, and loses everything, and it just seems like the Lord is allowing the enemy to come and just beat him up. And at the end, things seem to get better. But it's a difficult journey. It's not what we want to hear. Uh, books like Song of Solomon, which is just weird and uncomfortable. It's a love song and somewhat erotic. And we're like, why is it here? And historians and scholars have asked that question as well on some of those books. They've wrestled with them. Should they be in canon or not? Second Peter is one of them books that scholars and historians have wrestled with through the ages. Um, there's things within it that challenge some of our theological ideas. And many preachers tend to avoid these books. I remember when I was a younger pastor, someone said, no one ever preaches out of Ecclesiastes, and I took that as a challenge, and so we were going to do a verse-by-verse -verse study of Ecclesiastes, and I think I got to chapter 4, and I was like, I'm done with this. I quit. I quit. I cannot do it anymore. Uh, Second Peter is one of those books. A lot of... Uh, a lot of, especially Protestants, do not like 2 Peter. They don't like preaching it. Um, Luther and Calvin really were not fans of this book. Since the Reformation, much of the church has kind of pulled back from it because the feel is this book is too Catholic. It's just too Catholic. And what I mean by that is that as Peter writes... It seems like he's promoting this idea of good works, that we need to be doing good works to appease God. But the deeper we get into this book, we'll discover that that's really not the case. That's not what Peter is saying. And I think we'll find, as we go through it, that, that this is not a Catholic letter. This is a letter that's designed for the entire church. It's a letter that's extremely relevant for us today. 
in our time, in our place, in our society. Uh, Dick Lucas and Christopher Green open up their commentary on 2 Peter uh, with this introduction. Fakes are a nuisance. Fake artists make fools of collectors. Fake financiers embezzle millions at the expense of honest investors. Fake scientists inflate their own reputations by writing on the back of other people's hard research. In some other areas of life, though, fakes are not merely a nuisance, but actually pose a serious threat. There is, for example, the potential damage caused by religious fakes. The obvious one, those who are in it just for the money or prestige, can be avoided without too much difficulty. Harder to uncover, but much more destructive in the end, are the well-meaning but muddled individuals who pass on a mixture of easy platitudes, biblical-sounding phrases, and a view of life that is twisted out of any recognizable biblical shape. Such Christian con artists are the reason Peter wrote this letter. They not only prey on people's wallets or good nature, ultimately they can wreck our eternal destiny, since a false gospel tells lies about God. Second Peter is very similar to 2 Timothy in the sense that Peter knows that his time is short. Peter's in Rome when he writes this, and his martyrdom is close. And he knows it. We talk about 1 Peter as it being written to the churches in, in modern-day Turkey. 2 Peter, we're not exactly sure who he's writing this to, but the thoughts are he's writing it to a specific church, probably in that same region. And Peter's concern is that something is going wrong in that church. Someone is preaching a fake gospel. Someone is teaching things that are distorting the gospel, thereby leading the church into a bad place, away from Jesus. Peter knows that his time is short, knows that soon he will be martyred, and he wants to make sure that one of the last things he does is make sure that the churches that he has relationship with will continue in the faith, in the real faith, after he's gone. I mentioned that this book is relevant for us today because we live in a time and a place where there are a lot of pressures being placed on the church. In years past, the primary source of religious understanding, of spiritual growth, of discipleship, came from the local church. People looked at pastors as someone who was very educated, who understood Scripture, who spent the time studying their Scripture, and they respected what a pastor would have to say. Oh, sure. Many of us read other books or listened to some radio uh, programs or things like that, but the bulk of our understanding, the bulk of what we knew came from the local church. And the things that we got on the side, we tended to judge by what we learned in the local church. Today, things have flipped. You can find teachings everywhere, and people do. There are these national prophetic voices out there, uh, more so now than there have ever been. You can go on YouTube and find millions of different teachers, most of whom have, are completely unvetted, who can speak exactly what you want to hear, that lines up perfectly with whatever your political or spiritual or, or cultural biases or beliefs may be. Because of that, things have changed. Now, the local church is no longer the primary source of discipleship, of education. But now it's outside sources, and because of that, people judge the local church by what they hear on YouTube. Do you agree with what so-and-so says on YouTube? There's a belief that just because someone has a YouTube channel, they probably know more than what my local pastor does. I mean, my local pastor only has like 40 followers. This guy on YouTube, he's got hundreds of thousands. How do we know what is real and what is fake? How do we know what will lead us towards Jesus 
and what could possibly lead us away from Jesus. Second Peter will help us with that discernment. Now Peter begins this letter by reminding us exactly who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 3, he says this, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Though, uh, through, these th or through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. That makes sense, right? Peter opens this up. Uh, his opening statement is, is very confusing. And, and, and honestly, words like divine power and knowledge and participate in divine nature, they make us a bit uncomfortable. Some of it even sounds a bit like Eastern mysticism. Become one with God. But if we take our time through this section, we'll discover that that's actually not the case. It's actually a continuation of what Peter was telling us in 1 Peter. Now, the first thing we need to realize is that in the Greek, these first 11 verses of 2 Peter, they're one sentence. It's a tremendously long, run-on sentence. And because of that, this is a single thought that Peter is trying to get through to us. The opening statement here is helpful for us to understand not only what he's saying in this, in this first section, but, but also as a key to the entire letter. Peter starts by reminding us that Jesus has given us everything we need, not only just to get into heaven, but everything we need to overcome, as he puts it, the corruption of the world caused by evil desire. Let me simplify what that means. Jesus has given you everything you need to overcome the sin that you deal with in your life. Everything that you need to overcome it. Jesus' death and resurrection, as well as the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, are all we need to overcome any difficulty, any sin, any temptation, anything that seems to be tripping us up in life. Now, the confusion that comes in this is this argument between justification and sanctification. Because as we get into this, we're going to start hearing things about some, uh, some activities that we should be doing, some works that should be in our life. And we hear that and we think, wait a minute, isn't it, you know, we're saved by faith alone? Well, that's faith alone right there. Christ has given you all you need to overcome. You've been justified through the cross, through the blood, through the work of Christ. But that transformation to whom you're supposed to become, that sanctification, that comes by the fruit that comes out of your life. The things that you do that come out of the faith that you have. See, Peter's trying to remind us that we don't need anything or anyone other than Jesus. But since the creation of the world, we've always felt like we needed something else, something more. There's always something more we need, right? Think of Adam and Eve. If we only had knowledge, if we only ate of the fruit and had the knowledge of what is good and evil, then we'd be just like God. We can't trust Him. We need that fruit. Think about the Israelites. If we only had a king, I know God is our king, but if we only had a king, then things would be better. If we only had the protection of the other gods and the cultures around us, then things would be better. Think about the dilemma of the early church. If you were only circumcised, then perhaps you'd be closer to God. It's always Jesus plus. It's this desire, or maybe it's fear, that, that maybe Jesus isn't enough. Maybe we need something more than Jesus. Think about today. Jesus is great, but if we had power, if we had political power, if we had social power to tell people what to do, then, 
That's what Peter's reminding us here. We claim we love Jesus, but we struggle with trusting him enough to believe that he is all we need. And Peter starts this by saying, he is all you need. We're going to see in the next few weeks that there are teachers telling them that there is life in things outside of Jesus. That Jesus is all fine and great, but let's be honest. Where is he? He hasn't come back like he said he would. And so we struggle to live a holy life and we look around us and the world seems to be doing quite well. What if we just aligned with them? Because I don't know where this Jesus is. He hasn't come back yet. Sound familiar? That lie has been present for 2,000 years. And that's the lie that Peter wants to deal this. Peter is reminding us that Jesus has provided everything that we need, not only to get into heaven, but to experience heaven here on earth. Now, if that's true, if Jesus has given us everything that we need, how then should we live? What should our lives look like? Well, Peter gets to that next. Verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness, godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For you... If you possess these qualities in an increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. This list is similar to Paul's fruits of the Spirit in Galatians that we're familiar with. But there's something about fruit that we need to remember. When a tree produces fruit, it's not because it's trying to. A tree doesn't like sit there and go, okay, I need fruit, I need fruit. Fruit just happens. It happens naturally. If a tree is mature enough, if it receives enough water, enough sun, enough nutrients, then the tree will produce fruit. When we first moved back to Illinois, we lived on a farm and there was a cherry tree in our front yard. And and that first, we didn't know it was a cherry tree because we moved into the house in the middle of February. But later in the summer, we had a, a really nice summer, plenty of rain, plenty of sun, plenty of everything. And towards the end of the summer, all of a sudden, there were all these cherries that came out of nowhere. We weren't trying to get cherries. They just came because the fruit was present. The same is true in our faith. If our faith is mature enough, if we tend it, if we feed it, then our lives will naturally produce fruit. Notice what Peter says here. It all starts with faith. Our faith in Jesus. And our faith in Jesus is the seed for that fruit in our life. But the challenge is, is that for some people, they feel that that's enough. They've prayed the prayer, they've done the sacraments, they've made the decision for Jesus, and they wonder why their faith seems unsatisfying. They wonder why it feels like there's no fruit in their life. It's because Jesus isn't looking for a decision. Jesus is looking for a disciple. And a disciple is one who is trying to become more like the person they are following, who's trying to become more like Jesus. They are intentionally going in Jesus' footsteps and trying to pick up Jesus' characteristics. The list that Peter is giving us is what it looks like to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. These are the nutrients that produce fruit in our lives. These are the characteristics of the one who trusts Jesus and knows that Jesus has given them everything that they need. It all starts with faith. But notice what comes next. Add to your faith goodness. What's goodness? Well, goodness is is being like Jesus because Jesus would was good. You know, that old 
wristband, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's goodness. What would Jesus do in this situation? Maybe I should do that. To goodness, knowledge. Not book smarts, but actual knowledge of Jesus. What pleases Jesus? To knowledge, add self-control. What self-control? Being able to say no to the things that don't please Jesus. Come on, we all know what mostly what things in our life that probably don't please Jesus. Self-control is being able to say no to those things. To self-control, perseverance. What's that? It's the ability to overcome, to stay the course. Remember 1 Peter? To keep the faith, even in times of difficulty, even in moments when it's not easy. To persevere. To persevere godliness. This doesn't mean becoming like God. Instead, this is acting like Jesus to the world around us. People experience Jesus through your life. Do they see it? Next, mutual aff affection. Not affliction. Affection. How do we treat one another in the church? And then finally, love. How do we love? Now these qualities don't build upon one another. It's not like, okay, I'm working on knowledge today, so that means I don't have to be self-controlled. Once I get knowledge, I'll figure it out. Then I'll start controlling my life. No, 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 no. These qualities are present. They should be present in our lives. And it's not that we need to master them. We just need to be growing in them. Notice what he says in verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, the reality is we all stumble, we all struggle, and, and Peter's not calling us to perfection. He's calling us to presence, that these qualities be present and growing in our lives. I look at where I was 30 years ago compared to where I am today. And I see that today I have a little bit more self-control. Today I have a little bit more perseverance. Today I have a little bit more love. It's growing. As they grow, it produces nutrients in our life that produce fruit. But if they're not present, then maybe we should be concerned. Verse 9, but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed of their past sins. We are saved by faith alone, but we become more like Jesus when we begin to imitate Him. The decision is the first step. We're saved through that decision. But then we're called to be like Him. So what do we do to develop these qualities in our life? Well, I'm going to sound like a clanging gong. Remember the bells analogy that we talked about in the, fall, in the spring, in the summer? And now, if you bless three people every day or every week, Bless three people. One who doesn't go to church. If you eat with three people every week, one of which does not go to church. If you spend some time every week learning about Jesus. If you spend some time listening to the Holy Spirit. If you spend some time and notice when God is using you when you're a sent one. Those activities begin to grow much of what Peter here is talking about. Now, Peter concludes this section with a very interesting promise. Verse 10. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. One of the challenges, like I mentioned, of this book and this passage is that there are times when Peter seems like he's talking about works, like we need to be doing good deeds. And it would be really easy to read this and think that salvation is somehow tied into what we do, more so than it's about faith. But that's not what Peter's talking about. When I was in the business world, uh, and we were based out of Chicago, and I was working for Caterpillar, I did a lot of traveling um, I would fly down to Nashville and back a lot because that's our division's corporate office was in Nashville. And uh, back then, they really liked us to use Southwest because it was cheap. And we really liked using Southwest because Caterpillar had a rule that we had to turn in our mileage to the company, um, you know, frequent flyer mileage. But back then, with Southwest, you had like a punch card for how many trips you took. So we all wanted to take Southwest because then we got a free trip for our vacations. We didn't have to turn that in to the company. Back in the old days, Southwest only flew out of Midway. I don't know if you've ever flown out of Midway, but flying out of Midway is an adventure, okay? I joke about it. O'Hare has these large, spacious runways. And Midway, itty bitty little tiny runways. And so taking off on a 737 on a Midway is like, you know, you just feel the pilot just holding the brakes in and gunning the engine full step and then letting the brakes go and shot back into your chair and he gets to the end of the runway and before he crashes into Cicero and takes out the neighborhood, he pulls up and you go straight up in the air, right? Okay. Take off. Takeoff's never the problem at Midway. Landings. Landings are the problem at Midway. I mentioned itty bitty little runways. There's an old saying in flying that any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. That may be true, but there's a difference between a really nice, comfortable landing and a hard landing. And the first time I flew into Midway, I remember I was sitting, the plane was half empty, the seat next to me was empty, and I was reading a book, and the stewardess came on and said, you know, put your seat belts back on, we're about ready to land. And I put the book next to me on the seat as we were landing. So in Midway, when O'Hare, when a plane is landing, as many of you know, it just kind of lightly comes over the suburbs and maybe through the city. And you look at the pretty lights, and then it gently puts down and coasts to a stop. In Midway, they drop that thing straight out of the air and hit the brakes, OK? Just, you know, boom. My book picked up off the air and went flying three rows ahead into the wall at the front of the, uh, at the, front of the airplane. <laughs> Almost hit somebody. I'd apologize. Oh, sorry. Since then, I've learned you put the book in the, in the, in the thing in the seat in front of you, right? You know, that's landing at Midway. We have a choice, okay? Faith will get you to heaven. How do you want to get there? Paul talks about, do you want to get there with the smell of smoke on your clothes? Or as Peter says, do you want to get there and receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom? See, that rich welcome, that's that well done, good and faithful servant. I don't know about you, but I prefer landing at O'Hare over Midway any day. Okay? And I don't know about you, but I'd prefer hearing well done, good and faithful servant more so than congratulations, you made it in by the skin of your teeth. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just thank you we thank you for what you've done in our lives. Jesus, we thank you for what you've done on the cross. We thank you that, as we said during communion, it is enough. That what you've done is enough. But Lord, we also realize that as we follow you, we should be picking up your characteristics.
So Lord, come right now. Come and begin to transform our lives. Lord, we ask for goodness in our lives. We ask for knowledge of You and self-control and perseverance and godliness. We ask for the ability to, to just have right relationships with one another. And more so, Lord, we ask that our lives be defined by love. So Holy Spirit, come. Come and work within us. I'm going to ask a couple of the ministry team to come up. Um, we don't abruptly close. We kind of soft close. But it's, it's hitting me right now that uh, for many of us, we've made decisions to follow Jesus in our lives. At some point, as I look across this room, I know many of us have made a decision to follow Jesus. And if you've not made that decision, this might be a good time. If you've not had that moment where you said, okay, Jesus, I need you in my life. This might be a good time for that. But for the rest of us, we've made the decision, but we know that the fruit is lacking. We look around and, and there are no, there's no fruit on the tree. There's nothing happening. And, and if we're honest with ourselves, uh, faith has just become this rote activity that we do. We come to church, we do our thing, and we leave. And at moments, it has become a drudgery. But Jesus says he's come to give us life, and life in abundance. And as we look at our lives, we think, if this is abundance, there must be more. If you're wrestling with that today, I want to invite you to come up. Brenda's here, and Jeff, or John? Jeff. And Jeff will be here. Or John. <laughs> John will be here. I'm sorry. And they'd love to pray for you on this. Because as we follow Jesus, we should experience life. We should experience the fruit of the Spirit pouring out of our lives. We should be experiencing joy and hope. When you have a tree that is struggling, sometimes it just takes in a little PLC. Years ago, Cindy did this play, The Christmas Cactus. And so she bought everybody these Christmas cactuses. And we had one. We ignored it for about a year. Because it's a cactus, right? And we thought it was dead. Absolutely dead. And then I took it and I put it in the front window. And I watered it. Stirred it up a bit. And lo and behold, a cactus popped out of the ground. And then two months later, it bloomed. Sometimes we just need to stir up and put it in sun, water it. Sometimes we need to do that with our faith. So if that's where you're at today, before you leave, I want to invite you to come up and, and we want to pray for you. We want to pray that the Holy Spirit comes that begins to stir up that faith in you, that it begins to put the Son of the Lord Jesus in you and on you, and that you experience the water of the Holy Spirit just filling you and bringing life. If you're not sure about that seed of faith, then come up as well. We want to pray for you. wrap up, feel free to come up and pray or for prayer. I think Cindy's going to sing or not. But otherwise, may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you in the wilderness. May he protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you 
May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. If you are dry, if you are tired, if you are weary, come up. As the old song says, come to the fountain. The Lord wants to meet